Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm I'm Neil, Dr. Neil Cox, um, and um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about essentially the uncanny, um, but the uncanny in the context about kind of critical debates um, about the Australian uncanny. Um, before we go forward, um, I'm going to. Um, uh, just a couple of bits of kind of housekeeping. There is a trigger warning for the second half of this. We're going to sort of take a break halfway through and I can answer some questions and have a chat, you know, and see how it's going. Um, and it kind of falls into two sections, this talk, because I'm talking about two different critics. In the second bit, there is um, a reference to um, sexual assault and I'm going to um, give you this single signal at the beginning and at the end of that. Okay. Um, secondly, um, I think I can, I'm going to introduce this by sort of saying that um, I'm, yeah, it's a kind of a, like an apology thing, really, because I'm, I'm talking today about the Australian uncanny, and my, my talk is going to be, actually, it's going to be, it's going to be quite tangential, actually, um, in, in itself, and I'll, I'll keep coming back to why we're doing this within, um, a session on the gothic because in the second you know in the second part of my talk you know we're going to do ghosts and bunyips and, and, and other things like that um but a lot of what i'm talking about is um uh might seem just more talking about kind of politics and the politics of literature maybe and so i just want to keep coming back to why why we're doing this in in, in the discussion of the gothic and it's essentially because my interest is primarily in the uncanny and the uncanny as we know is called upon in much gothic criticism um, whether it's questioned you know whether there is a sense that the way we often think about the uncanny isn't um, uh, sufficiently historicized and often it's quite a powerful argument um, or whether we're debating the finer points of psychoanalysis or whether we're rejecting the concept completely or we're saying it's going to be refined, um, the uncanny, that kind of weird sense that something is familiar and strange at the same time, uh, yeah, is often called upon in, in um, Gothic discussions. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm interested in. But primarily, I guess, I'm interested in the way, in the very kind of, understandable and noble and it's, it's all good kind of way that the uncanny is politicized or understood to have a kind of a political dimension. And the last thing I want to do is, um, is dismiss that. I think that's, that's necessary for any discussion of the uncanny. But kind of what worries me or what I just want to think through or what makes me feel slightly nervous is an idea of the uncanny as having a use, a specific use. The idea, I think we can trace this back to, um, well, we can trace back much further, but I think in the early 90s, you know, um, uh, hugely influential and important critics like um, Alan Lloyd Smith, for example, uh, who I was have studied under, so, you know, a very, sympathetic to kind of try to understand the uncanny not in a kind of rarefied psychological way but as a kind of an expression of kind of um, the political repressed or something caught up with the kind of the deep past of nations that they don't want to admit to you know, that there is something uncanny about a, um, a kind of the way that a national identity will, will kind of tell it a story about itself, but will have to kind of repress certain elements um, of its history, especially its racist history, to the side and the way that these can return. And, and of course, this is an incredibly important work, but the problem of the uncanny is that it is a figure of supplementarity. It's a figure of disruption. It's a figure of uneasiness. 
the uncanny is never our friend. It comes home and it messes with the furniture. It really does. And my concern here really is that sense that when we do the necessary work of kind of politicizing the gothic or politicizing the uncanny, we shouldn't maybe be, you know, overly confident that we're actually going to end up sitting on top of the dung heap, you know. So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to introduce myself, my interest in the Australian uncanny, and I'll keep that quick, but it will, it will take the form of a kind of confessional where I'm just going to say I'm not worthy, essentially. And then I'm going to introduce two texts, um, Alan Lawson's The Anxious Proximity of Settler Postcolonial Relations, which is a quite short article, um, collected in the Rivkin and Ryan um, Critical Theory, um, uh, a collection which many um, universities use as a kind of uh, an in, a, a BA introduction to kind of critical theory. And Alison Ravenscroft's The Postcolonial Eye. Um, uh, there's kind of, sort of 10 years between these, one's kind of 90s and the other one is a, a, a 2000 kind of text. Um, and they both have very different takes on the Australian uncanny, and they kind of argue with each other, yeah. And I'm going to, first of all, offer as simple reading as I can of Lawson's argument, so we can kind of get where we are with it. Um, and then I'm going to question two aspects of his approach to the Australian uncanny in more detail, because he himself divides his argument between talking about what he calls affect, you know, the emotional hit, and effect, which is something about structure. Um, and I'm going to sort of suggest why his kind of move to politicise the uncanny is itself subject to uncanny effects. There's something spooky going on. He becomes hoist on his own guitar, you know, um, the joke comes upon him in the end. All through this talk, I want to point out um, uh, when I can, I, you know, that as I'm, I'm reading these critics and kind of pointing out where their arguments become haunted by the very um, things that they, 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 they want to sort of condemn, um, I, I'm certainly not above this and I'm um, as caught and victimised and made foolish by the uncanny as, as anyone else. Um, uh, one thing that is really important to stress from the first, I think, is that Lawson and Ravencroft, I think, are brilliant. Um, I found their work inspiring and challenging and fantastic. Um, and you know, this shouldn't be um, this shouldn't be read as me kind of doing the wagging finger on it, because if I start to wag a finger, the finger will point at me. That's the necessary aspect of the uncanny, I think. Um, then I want to introduce Ravenscroft's argument and see how they kind of work, um, uh, uh, they, they kind of, they kind of criticise um, Lawson's, yeah. And they kind of suggest that the problem with Lawson is that it's too sort of structural. He doesn't understand that the uncanny is something that we feel as individuals. The uncanny is spooky. It's something that we kind of meet as people. And there's a sense that even though he says he's doing it, Lawson doesn't quite, doesn't quite kind of credit that with, for, for Ravenscroft at least. Um, but then I want to sort of question Ravenscroft's own idea about what it might mean to read in perspective, to sort of take on um, the sort of subjective point of view, to think about things like affect, to think about positionality. Um, right from the start, I think I can say that the, the basic problem with Lawson for Ravenscroft is that he's kind of really smart and he's really great, but he, he doesn't really understand the embodied nature of the uncanny. So in the end, it kind of doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're indigenous or not, for example, really. And, and there's clearly a problem with that. Um, and I'm gonna conclude, um, and, and lastly, 
I probably won't get through all this. Who knows what I'll get through? Yeah, I'm just going to talk. Yeah, and then stop and then talk again. That's what that's what's going to happen. We'll see where we get. Okay. Um, okay. So first of all, in terms of introducing myself, my Austra uh, interest in the Australian uncanny, I have no expertise in Australian literature. I have no expertise in Australian Gothic, and I have no expertise in Australian uncanny. I am so sorry for this. Yeah. Um, what I do have is a long-term interest in um, uh, the uncanny generally and one of the things that I'm working on at the moment is a, a book on the uncanny and kind of problems with reading the uncanny and I came across Lawson's essay when I was actually doing an undergraduate lecture and yeah it, it struck me as in, in extraordinarily well kind of argued and engaged and interesting but I could see kind of I could see it as kind of exemplifying certain problems um, that I have encountered myself when I'm trying to offer a kind of a political account of the uncanny, and that's kind of how I got into it. Okay. Um, in terms of introducing now Lawson's argument, okay, on, on the most basic terms, Lawson's essay is interested in accounting for repeated images um, and themes in colonial texts through an appeal to the uncanny. So the thing that strikes him, and this is already to go on to the, the detail bit a little bit, is he was reading the, like, um, unfortunately I had to do this as well, and it was one of the least pleasant experiences in my life. Um, he, he was reading um, Pauline Hansen's um, Racist, which is a politician, um, uh, uh, um, racist text, um, and was just struck by how just, bizarre you know the way the racism manifests is you know i mean racism you know but why does it have to take this form why are people saying not just being racist in general but being racist in this particular way okay and he's trying to think of how can we actually how can we kind of address what most of us, I think, would be something that is kind of unaccountable? I mean, how does this person get to this stage to say these things? Yeah. And he thinks he can account for it through the idea of the uncanny. Okay. So on a slightly more complex um, level, um, we've got the idea of kind of settler narratives in general. Um, narratives that are often interestingly positioned, and this is nothing particular to do with one kind of national identity for Lawson, it's something more kind of general. Um, he, sees, he sees kind of Pauline Hansen's work as kind of, um, you know, and, and she's like for the, you know, for those kind of, uh, I know kind of in a British context, you'd have to think of her kind of like something like um, the politics are kind of Britain first kind of politics, but with something of the success of Farage, it's something like that. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I, can, I can talk to that um, more if, if, if needed um, later. Um, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in as an academic is critiquing the right and the far right. My last book was about um, uh, um, uh, uh, questioning Anne Rand. It is something that I'm interested in doing. Um, and and Pauline Hansen's um, book includes one of the things it includes as, as it's kind of attacking um, indigenous uh, identities is a constant appeal to Aboriginal cannibalism. You know. Uh, it's one of the things that, um, you know, one of the things that is apparently such a problem. And this is, I mean, it goes without saying, this is just a hallucination of the most appalling type. And like, where does that even begin? And Lawson says, well, wh when we're thinking about this, we can think about it in terms of affect and effect. And when he's talking about affect, that's when he's talking most obviously about the uncanny. Um, Lawson's argument is kind of like to be a settler, um, 
is to take on an unsettled relationship with both the mother country and the indigenous population. Um, settlers find themselves repeating and opposing the position of both indigenous and colonial power, as the settler self is, in this understanding, constituted as its other anxiety results, and it is this that is expressed in the anxious tropes of proximity to be read in The Truth, which is Pauline Hansen's book, um, which, by the way, she didn't write. Uh, it was ghostwritten um, book. Uh, to be read in The Truth, tropes of being consumed by indigeneity, of being lost in the space of the other, of the un unheimlich type of home. Okay, so really, on, on a simple level, um, Lawson's saying, uh, there is a kind of, for him, this thing called a settler identity. Yeah. And it's kind of oddly split. Because in one sense, as it's opposed to an idea of indigenous identity. But as there is, um, as, as time goes on, yeah, there is a sense in which in the context of the mother country, yeah, the settler identity is also kind of caught up, is also too close to that indigenous identity it's also set against. It's quite a familiar idea, isn't it, in, in, that, in that kind of way. And it's this idea that there is something too proximate, too close, too near about the identity of that other that there is something um, the same and not the same, you know, owned and alien. And that closeness is a great worry. And one of the things it produces, for example, is kind of like fantasies about being consumed by the other about being taken over and sort of just eaten up by the other. One's identity is not sufficiently differentiated. It's too close. I'm going to be consumed. Anxiety. Horrible images of cannibals. That's the idea. And the other idea is one about effect. And that's more of a kind of a structural historical idea. And from this Lawson, like, takes on the ideas of Frederick Jameson. Um, uh, and the idea is essentially that sometimes we encounter um, images, like for example, um, uh, shaking hands, for example, would be a classic thing, yeah. Why do we do that, you know? And the idea is that from our perspective, we can work out there must have long time ago been a reason for that some kind of contextual situation which everyone understood you know and the classic thing is it's something about swords or something like that is yeah, okay um but it's kind of lost to us people back then would have grabbed it instinctively they would have known exactly what it is um but that kind of understanding is is irrecoverable we, we never can quite going to bond with that understanding but what we have instead are these kind of detached tropes, these kind of um, these kind of actions, like you know, shaking hands, you know, lifting your hat or whatever. Yeah. Um, they have a kind of they're kind of powered by the original ideology, the original context. But that context is also kind of lost in a weird way. Yeah. And one of the things we can try and do, although we can never completely successfully do it, is try to imagine the original ground in which these things made sense. So if one of the ideas Lawson's interested in is that idea that there is something about the uncanny which is too close, yeah, and that makes us nervous and it's an effect and it's a feeling. The other is that there is a kind of a structural idea that we have these horrible and nonsensical images and tropes but actually what they're doing is that they are, they are pointing to the fact that at some point there must have been a contextual situation where these aren't justified, but they at least make sense, make terrible sense, but at least make sense. And that's the two kind of things he's going for. Lastly, 
he has recourse to this thing called uh, Zygma, Zygma, you know, which is a rhetorical um, uh, um, uh, move. It's kind of like um, when you say something like, um, I left with my dignity and my hat. I left without my dignity and without my hat. Yeah. Two different kind of senses are yoked together in the same sentence. And for him, sort of Zoigma gives a sense of how we might kind of start to move forward, which is something about embracing the uncanny. In seeing in this kind of weird proximity, this kind of almost but not quiteness. Yeah. This strange kind of closeness of two things that also don't quite fit together. Um, that we think we, we find in these things a kind of a model of maybe how to move on. Yeah, of how to work forward. Yeah. Um, the idea he's calling on here is, um, you know, like uh, Queensland versus Wick, you know, the, the whole um, idea of kind of, of land claims, where um, there, is a, there is an idea of um, that two different claims on land can happen at the same time. Um, so here's, here's one formulation of it. Um, in a move echoed in the works of critics, including Ken Gelder and Jane Jacobs, um, you can see there, um, hugely influential, Uncanny Australia. Um, uh, uh, there, yeah. Um, the idea is that this sense of the uncanny is related to 1990s land claims. Uh, most importantly, the Wick settlement that found the law to be open to two opposing claims to have a single piece of land rather than the uh, indigene having an original past claim and the settler subsequent, Wick is understood to support, suggest that the indigene cannot be relegated to something that is merely chronologically prior and the settler cannot merely come at the end of history, the winning post. In other words, what the Wick settlement does in terms of contested ideas about who owns land, yeah, is to say there could at the same time be two different legitimate claims on the same piece of land. Like the rhetorical figure of Zoigma, yeah, has got kind of two meanings that are yoked in one sentence. There is the sense that this one bit of land can be owned in two different ways at the same time. And this again gets Lawson back to that sense of the uncanny, that what is mine is also yours, that what is the self is also the other, that that relationship is absolutely split, but it's also close, it's uncanny, it's contested. Okay. Um, where to begin with this? Where to begin with this? Let's start, let's start with. Let's start with, very, I promise, very briefly, going back to Freud, okay, and the Freud that um, uh, um, uh, Lawson quotes, okay. Um, perhaps the most useful place to start, he says, I'm thinking about the effective functioning of the repressed knowledge is Freud's 1919 essay, The Uncanny. And already I'm kind of slightly worried there about the idea of this being useful, okay. Um, and Freud quotes this, uh, we, our, our primitive forefathers, once believed in the possibility of these things. Nowadays, we no longer believe in them. We have surmounted such ways of thought, but we do not feel quite sure of our new self-beliefs, and the old ones still exist within us, ready to seize upon any confirmation. As soon as anything actually happens in our lives, we seem to support the old discarded beliefs. We get a feeling for the uncanny. And then Lawson writes, now I think this is how Freud, after all this time, can be useful. What is crucial about Freud's uncanny is that it is not the unfamiliar which is the source of anxiety, is what Gelder and Jacobs call the sense of being in place and out of place. Out of place, not pace, simultaneously. In this moment, what is ours is also potentially or even already theirs. The one may be the other. And if we're going to fix on one thing, and I'm not going to fix on it just now, but this is kind of the overall thing, that claim about the one may be the other is certainly something we can see is, is um, calling on, I think, gothic ideas of the uncanny. 
but is also where the politics of this are most obviously problematic. Okay, but I wanna, I wanna think about, it, it, it's just strange, okay? So we've got this idea that this is useful, but we've also got the idea that this is useful only after a certain amount of time. And also the idea that there is something crucial about Freud's uncanny. So we've already got kind of a hierarchy here. We've got a kind of a functionality. Freud's text is useful. There is something in it that's crucial. And that means there are things that are kind of supplementary and periphery and aren't, you know, important. But we kind of know the thing about the uncanny is that the, the peripheral is always coming back to the centre. That's kind of what happens in it. So I'm going to think, mm, is there something kind of odd here? And we've also got this idea that, you know, that even though the text is there, the text is written in 1919, um, it only becomes useful at another time, after this time. And actually he says somewhere else about that this is, it becomes useful in the moment of post-colonialism. Yeah. And I'm thinking here that, um, that that's a strange thing, yeah? Because um, it means that sort of the time of the uncanny isn't Freud's text, isn't its own time. It becomes what it is only after time. After time has passed, we can look back and say, oh, well, that's what it always was about. You know, that's what its use was. And actually, if we begin to think about Freud's text, the actual words here, we can, we can start to get a sense of that kind of, that strange kind of doubleness and spookiness. We, or our primitive forefathers once believed in the possibility of these things. He's talking about um, uh, um, the omnipresence of thoughts. Nowadays, we no longer believe in them. We have surmounted such ways of thought. As soon as everything actually happens in our life, which seems to support the old discarded beliefs, we get a feeling of the uncanny. We, okay, we here, we, in the quote, is about a continuum. We, or our primitive forefathers, once believed in the possibility. So back in the day, yeah, that was we. There's two models of history here. And then there's one that's a continuum where it's always we, 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 we. And back in the day, it was still we. Yeah, um, we've always been around. And the other one is a kind of a split one where there was our primitive forefathers. Our primitive forefathers are not the we, are they? They are different. In that one, there was the forefathers and then there's us. And then the other one, it's always been us. Yeah. And so that kind of we, that we identity, in one sense is the thing that's always going on. It's the thing that gives continuity. It's the thing that gives a sense of stability to us. Okay. But also in that, it introduces a split because the we back in the day, is kind of interchangeable with our primitive forefathers. There's our primitive forefathers, there's we. Which one is it? I don't know, because it doesn't really matter. Yeah, we, primitive forefathers, much of a muchness, okay? But the we now is absolutely not the primitive forefathers, and it's logically not, because those are different things, but actually, if you look at the belief, and I haven't got time to do this now, but if you actually read through the quotes on the belief, these are very different things. There is, I once believed, now we long believe in them. Yeah, we have surmounted such thought. Yeah, our new set of beliefs. Beliefs. Sometimes this is about active believing. Sometimes it's about belief as something that's kind of hard and impacted and definite. Something is about getting over those old beliefs. The kind of the belief of the present is not the same as the believing in the past. There is a definite split here. The very thing that's offering a continuity is also kind of problematizing that. And I think we can, to kind of really eke out what, what's, what's difficult here, here's, here's, here's a kind of a classic version of this from The Uncanny, and Lawson doesn't quote this one, but I think it's interesting. The Uncanny is really, is in reality nothing new or alien, but sometime, something which is familiar and old established in the mind, and which has become alienated from it only through the process of repression. 
This reference to the factor of repression enables us furthermore to understand Schilling's definition of the uncanny as something which ought to have remained hidden but has come to light. Okay, so in one very basic sense, what this is saying is the uncanny is not, when we encounter the uncanny, when I suddenly find myself doing something and I realize actually that's something I used to do when I was like four, you know, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm shocked by it, the, the kind of strangeness of me, yeah. It's, it's not new, it's not alien. It's something which is familiar and old established. So when I do this thing, when I get this uncanny effect, the whole point is that it's old established. It hasn't changed. The whole force of the uncanny is that I've met something that hasn't changed. Has it changed? No, it has not changed. Yeah, I'm meeting something that is old. Nothing has changed in it. And the horror is, oh my gosh, I haven't moved on. You know, you know, there is this thing inside me which is just, it just has remained. It has not changed. But here's the twist, yeah? The thing that I encountered is something old established. It's old established. That means, of course, it hasn't changed because it's old established. But when you think about it, back in the day, the first time that happened when you were four, it wasn't old established. It was only old established from the position now. The thing that you've encountered, the uncanny thing, on the one hand, the whole point of it is that it hasn't changed because it's old established. Yet, because it's old established, of course it's changed because it wasn't originally old established. It's only become old established over time. That is the uncanny effect. The very thing that makes something unchanged transforms it. The very thing that makes something old is the thing that makes it new. Uncanny effect. And when I'm thinking back to Lawson here, you know, I'm thinking that here's the thing, that the reading I've just done there, and there's lots of different readings we can do, I don't think it's got any place in what he's saying is crucial about the uncanny. I think that what he's saying is timely about the uncanny and is crucial about it and why it's useful in the moment of, post of, of the post-colonial is nothing to do what I've said. In other words, his idea of usefulness has to repress or not take on the kind of reading that I'm offering. But the kind of reading I'm offering is suggesting that actually perhaps this was always an issue in the uncanny, but it was only issue, an issue always in the uncanny from the position now. What am I doing here? I'm suggesting that the uncanny worries certain narratives of time and certain narratives of use and certain narratives of saying this is happening now absolutely it's a trope of disruption and looking at the time yeah i'm going to zoom over soigma yeah um uh, to keep on i'm going to gesture to this very very quickly because this is, um, this is the kind of the uncanny um, uh, aspect of it. And Lawson is saying, look, what's, what's uncanny here? What's really kind of strange and uncanny um, can be understood through this trope of Zoidman. Um, So how do we rethink the settler paradigm as a mediatory relationship? My suggestion is Zoigma, the figure of speech in which one, one word is placed in the same grammatical relation to two words, but in quite different senses as in Alistair Alexander Pope's or stain her honor or her new brocade. Usually the object contains one that is abstract and one that is concrete. Da, da, da. Yeah. Um, Zoigma is also down the bottom, the paradigm of the continuous challenge to the post-colonial intellectual, how to be theorized and grounded at the same time, how to maintain that non-quiet grammatical relation. Now, if I had word enough in time, I would do this in, in a lot of detail, but I can, you can kind of see the argument. You know, the argument here is that there is this kind of this rhetorical figure and it yokes two different things together in a sentence. 
just as there could be a joint land claim that's kind of joined together. There is the land and then there's two claims to it, yeah, and they can exist. And they exist together in a kind of an anxious way, but also that's okay, yeah. The first difficulty with this is, I, I, I'm just going to tease out two things that will, will be useful for useful for what I'm seeing. There, there you go. Um, for what's going to happen next, yeah, is that one word is placed in the same grammatical relation to two words, like or stain her honor on a new brocade. That's not three words. In his argument, he sees this as the relationship between three words. And actually, the idea of what, what does placing mean here is actually that's carrying a lot of weight because is actually the only thing that's important here is the three words or somehow the three words calling on all the others. One of the difficulties with his idea of Zeugner, yeah, is that he's using something which is um, about kind of classical languages and he's trying to think of it in terms of kind of analytic languages really you know and he can't really um take on the fact that there are there are there is more going on here than the relationship between three things so you could think of the word or i mean or is already saying that there is something more going on in this sentence that this sentence is linked to something else or we could look at her her is about ownership you know whole questions of ownership um the new brocade, okay? Um, that this is um, not simply about, as he says, the difference between materiality yeah, and metaphor, but there's something here about newness. And of course there is for Alexander Pope, because you know, newness and fashion and critiques, um, of, like the problematization of something that isn't kind of eternal, is these are all things that it's turning on. But those kind of extra words, seem to disappear from sight. This is an argument that, you know, of the uncanny, that must engage its own kind of pushing to the side and saying those bits don't really matter. But we know the uncanny is all about the return of these things. But there's something more kind of problematic here, I think, in that in one of these arguments, this is about something that's kind of, it's about three things in uneasy relationship. And they're two words and another word. But later on, he's sort of saying, yeah, Zeugner is also a way to think about the way that intellectuals, good intellectuals, have this challenge whether to be grounded, you know, or theorists, okay, political or theorists, I think that's what it means. And actually those things aren't the same at all. And when we start to think about this, we can start to think about like Alison Ray's and Ross's objection to all this. And it is because in one of them, the kind of the sentence, the text, is what exhausts the relationship, yeah? So there's two words and there's another word. And the uneasy relationship is about that is contained in the text. In the other one, we suddenly get the idea of an audience, you know, a reader, an intellectual, engaging two things. In the first one, when he's thinking about this, there is no reader, there is no audience, there is, there is no one else there. And the result is his thinking on the uncanny often doesn't include the idea of perspective, even when he's doing something on the uncanny as affect. Who is it that is being affected when we think about the sentence? There's nothing there. There's no kind of person there. There's no embodiment there. There's no perspective there. There's no third there. It's kind of exhausted you know, in the, um, uh, in the sentence. And this is what Alison Ravencroft objects to. And here she's not necessarily talking about Lawson, but she's talking about Gelder, um and Jacobs, which is the text that Lawson is, is engaged in. And she says, an understanding of the uncanny is an encounter with one's own alterity, not the alterity of the other. It is an alterity that cannot be torn out. The experience of the uncanny is radically subjective. It's not generalizable. It's always the effect of repression. So what she's sort of pointing to here is the, is the fact that this always involves kind of people or subject positions. You know, it's always about you being involved in it. It's always about the fact that suddenly you think you're distanced from something and you find you're caught up in it. Yeah. 
it's not something that we can understand in a purely kind of um, uh, kind of linguistic way in that way. Um, for Ravenscroft, there is a danger in talking about affect of in talking about effect of forgetting to ask whose effect we're referring to. Uh, the figure of Zoigma introduces a grammatical understanding that at certain stages allows for uncanny that avoids the challenge of narration, of the disruptive iterations the storytelling always involves. So Ravenscroft is saying the problem with this account, and actually with the account of effect that we'll look at as our last bit in this section, in the last 15 minutes of this, yeah, is that they are, um, they avoid narration, they avoid storytelling, they avoid the narrating third, they avoid the idea of subjectivity, and it becomes this kind of more formal, structural kind of difficulty. And I'm going to call on that in, in a bit. But her really essential, you know, objection to all this is, is a far kind of simpler one. Um, and I'm not going to do too much on this, or it, it informs everything we're talking about here and it's simply that this idea of the uncanny the one may be the other is clearly really problematic because if the one may be the other of course they're different yeah but also they're kind of not and that is kind of comforting for certain non-indigenous theorists and thinkers because it really doesn't mean um it doesn't matter you know in getting a kind of an indigenous perspective it doesn't matter about a real difference because in the end the indigenous it's different but it's also not different yeah you know, that there isn't something you know these are two equal land claims you know it's all the same land there isn't that sense that actually on another sense, radically not. It's not the same. From what perspective, again, on that three, are we seeing the two land claims to be about the same piece of land? Because from one of those perspectives on the land, they're not seeing the equality. It's like Lawson's argument wants to stand above this. And just to see, A and B is related to C. But the point is that for A, its relationship to C is the only thing it can see. It really sees the land in a certain way. It doesn't see equal equality of land claims. You know, it understands country in a certain way. Yeah. There is a, a problem here about kind of um uh there's a problem in saying that there isn't a problem. Yeah, that actually everything's okay. Yeah, that there is no real thing of difference to think about. Yeah. Um, here's, here's, the, here's the bit I really want to do. Yeah, so th this is, uh, um, if we're thinking about like kind of the point of what I'm doing, this is, this kind of section is kind of it. Yeah, and unfortunately it involves a little bit of kind of theory stuff, which I'll try and make as simple as possible. Yeah, um, we don't have to, um, we don't have to go into um, precise, the, the detail of Jameson's argument here. It's a very interesting argument, more interesting than I'm gonna let on here, in fact, I think. Um, in terms of effect, that idea that, you know, uh, we can see certain tropes, we can see certain actions, we can see like the shaking hand and, and we don't know we, they don't really make sense, but we can see that at one time they must have been meaningful. That kind of idea, the idea, idea of effect. Yeah, um, Lawson calls on the theories of Frederick Jameson. Yeah. And he says, a specific narrative paradigm continues to emit its signal long after its original content has become historically obsolete. The more archaic layer of content continues to supply vitality and ideological legitimization to its later and quite different historical function. Okay, so we've got um, a historical function, which is like the fact that I'm shaking hands. Yeah, and we've got this kind of um, original content, the idea that this was maybe something about um, swords, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Who knows? I don't know. Well, no, someone knows. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that that actually, although we can't actually get back and really understand 
that original meaning as it, as it totally was, it's still working away. You know, it's still kind of powering this later trope, but the two are completely different from each other. On the one hand, there's the ideology, yeah? And this is that kind of original contextual meaning that's lost. This exists nowhere as such, never being given directly in primal verbal form, but it's rather constructed after the event as working hypothesis and subtext. And crucially, this is, this is why, you know, I won't have enough time to talk about this in detail, but this is why Jameson's argument is so subtle and so brilliant. Yeah? It's a materialistic argument, yeah? but it's a materialism argument that is always about retrospection. It's about understanding that actually all of this is about something that we can't quite reach, that only really comes to us after the fact, that, in fact, that no repress without return, a classic uncanny thing in itself. Opposed to that original context, which is always retrospectively understood, which we never quite get to, but we know must be there, there are tropes, traces, material signifiers, the ideologian leaves when it vanishes into the past. So, you know, we've got um, shaking hands and whatever that original action is. And we've also got, for example, um, this horrific image of cannibalism, yeah, which is the material signifier and what it went, meant in the past, which is something about a fear of being consumed by the other, you know, of taken over by the other, of losing one's identity, you know, in terms of the other. The first thing about this, and again, I'm going to do this kind of quickly, and I'm just going to indicate this, is that this argument really requires the ideology, the original thing, and the trope, the thing that carries on, the material um, signifier that carries on, they are different. They are not the same. We cannot confuse these things. One of them is the material thing we meet every day. The other thing is the the cause of this that we can only ever know retrospectively it can't be the same thing okay have a look at this though when introducing the ideal regime itself this is what Lawson writes Lawson quotes Jameson's formulation of it as a historically determinate conceptual or semic complex which can be grasped as a form of social praxis that is as a symbolic resolution to a concrete historical situation but he also says this Later, uh, he responds to this quotation by stating that here is how we might regain our groundedness, our ability to see what we're being called tropes, what we've been calling tropes, as symbolic resolutions to concrete historical situations. I just want to draw your attention, and then I'm going to move on to something else, but I just want to draw your attention to the bizarreness of this. Tropes are not ideologies. Ideologies have nothing to do with tropes. You can't think of two more opposite things in this argument. There's the ideologene and there's the trope. Never the twain, okay? Yeah, what is an ideology? It's a symbol of resolution to a complex, concrete historical situation, yeah? And what is a trope? It's a symbolic resolution to a concrete historical situation. Isn't there something uncanny here, yeah? In according to Lawson's argument, the one may be the other. That's what he's saying. You know, the uncanny is. Even as he sets up this argument, he kind of goes for it. But there's, it, it gets much more spooky. Yeah. This is how he kind of explains what's going on. And at this point, even though he's talking about Pauline Hansen's um, uh, evil narrative, yeah, what he's trying to do is try, he's trying to set out the theory of the historicism. You know, he's setting out his own um, conceptual structural, academic understanding of what's going on, this theory of the ideology. Perhaps this allows us to think productively about the significance to us of Pauline Hansen's narrative of baby eating or Aborigines. A narrative is kind of failure in a sense that most of us find difficult to read, so it directs us to reread the historical ground on, on which it was once meaningful and strategic. Recurrent themes then, but what we've got used to calling tropes, such as the lost child, the half-breed, these are kind of the racist nonsense, you know, material signifiers that we're meeting all the time, and cannibalism, can only be understood as so many allusions to a more basic ideological sign, which would have been grasped instinctively, well, think about that, by any contemporary reader, but from which we are culturally and historically distanced. Yeah. So what we've 
got here? As he's accounting for this particular trope is the theory of the ideology. The ideology is that which would have been grasped instinctively by any reader. Yeah. But we, bear with me, are forever kind of alienated from it. We can never really meet it. Got it? I'm just getting my quote lined up. That is the theory. Okay. So let's go and have a look at what he says about one of these tropes. So if that's the theory, there is an ideology that we can only ever um, guess at, know retrospectively. An ideology that carries on because there are tropes, because there are these material signifiers, we know this thing must be there, but we can never grasp it. It persists, but we can never grasp it. Here then, he's talking about one of the particular tropes. Yeah. Asymptosis. Asymptosis, this, as he quotes, is getting close, but never becoming the same. And here he's talking about a particular racist narrative. The movement into indigenous space must be, must be for the racists, this is not good, must be asymptotic. Indigeneity must be approached, again, this isn't what we want, this is what the racists want, even appropriated, certainly photographed, but never touched. This produces in the settler subject the anxiety of proximity. The need then is to displace rather than replace the other, because the other must remain to signify the boundary of the self, to confirm the subjectivity of the other. The other, as a consequence of this almost but not quite move, is therefore always in some sense present, always uncannily ready to return. Okay. So within the racist discourse, what we've got here is that idea that the other, yeah, can't quite be got rid of. Because the self is confirmed by the continuation of this other. But this other can never actually be met. It can't be grasped, it can't be touched. It continues as something that's never encountered. Here's the spooky thing. The racist discourse, the trope, is one in which the other can never be touched. That it persists in never being actually touched. It persists in being different and never approachable. The racists need this thing that can never actually be directly encountered, but it can't ever go away because it must signify the difference. Doesn't that remind you a little bit of the ideology? The whole theory of the ideology the whole historicism here, the particular form of historicism, yeah, not it's historicism in general, but particular form here, is one in which the original meaning is never grasped, like the other is never touched. But it must constantly be there. It can never be got rid of because it is, even though it's the thing you never can actually encounter, it's the thing that actually gives legitimacy to what's going afterwards. In other words, and I've got a formulation, oh, I think we're, we're going to do another one, actually. Um, yeah, we, the, the difficulty here, isn't it, is that the, the critical language, the critical structure, uncannily repeats the specific, when we say pathological trope, the very thing he's attempting to diagnose and say, gosh, look at the stupid thing that people are saying, thinking, yeah. It 
uncannily repeats the very structure of his own academic liberal historical approach. Here's another one. He doesn't do it, just do it once. Here's another like bad racist trope, the dying race. Yeah, another classic trope. There is the end of time, the last of his tribe, the dying race. There is also the moment before time starts, the frozen moment just before settlement pacification, sorry, that's just not just the pre-contact moment. Figured as prehistory, golden age, essentially is past. In its most negative formulation, this manifests as the bad history of Terra Nullius, or as the persistent myth in all settler colonies of the pre aboriginal pre people who were here before the First Nations and functions as the corollary of the dying race. The indigenes weren't here at the beginning, they won't be here at the end. Okay. The frozen moment just before pacification, the moment before time starts. This moment out of time that you can never actually encounter, that is always, always there persisting as the idea of as the something before, which is held outside of history, as this thing that is forever outside of your grasp. It is the ideology. It is that idea of that thing that you never encounter. In other words, the force of my argument, and here is my own formulation of it, is uncanny iteration, uncanny, uncanny, uncanny iteration. In the very act of identifying the pattern, Lawson finds himself repeating it. The sober historical account is framed as a settler narrative, while settler narratives can be read as a form of the historicism that will bring them to light. As such, the trope is not safely secured as what might be termed content, but is in and out of place in exactly that uncanny sense that fires up Lawson's imagination. The process of effect sees progressive academic structure uncannily haunted by its racist target. In Lawson's language of effect, the one may also be the other. Okay, so two things here. One is to relate this back to the Gothic when we're thinking about the uncanny. One, I'm thinking about politicizing the uncanny. We should always be thinking also about that sense of return to our own arguments. That sense that the uncanny is about a kind of a demonic repetition and a demonic repetition that will always, you know, see the joke come upon us. That our very frame of understanding this uncanny is not beyond uncanny effects, but can actually be the mark of a certain reading and effect, an uncanny effect. And here, for example, I can see myself completely hoist of my own petard, yeah? Because one of the things that I'm arguing here, of course, is that there is a sameness between the ideology and the idea of um, the last of their race and the idea of asymptosis. So in other words, one of the things that I'm arguing for here is that there is something outside of the text that somehow is, is what the text actually is that actually I end up not understanding Ravenscroft's lessons, and they are good lessons to learn, but actually in my own way committing to a fundamental structure that persists um, regardless of um, individual subjective engagement and in, in embodiment. But of course, I'm also insisting there that there is a there is something in the repetition that isn't specifically to do with each one, but something that is in its own way untouchable, something that is actually constituted by that repetition, by the specifics of the individual texts, asymptosis, uh, ideology, last of their race, by those things, I'm suggesting that there is something that is there, the beating heart of them, the iterated structure of them. But I can never get that iterated structure without the individual material instances. I too find myself committed to asymptosis. I too find myself committed to the very thing that I'm whacking my finger at. Uncanny. Okay, and that's the end of my first bit.
Um, Thank you for that bit. Um, are you okay? To um, Alison Raven Ravencroft then kind of, oh no, I'm, we're, we're done. Okay. Um, yeah, so she's, she's kind of suggesting that the kind of approach done by um, Gerdes and Jacob and, and Lawson, um, it just doesn't account enough for kind of perspective and point of view. Yeah. Um, that the uncanny is something caught up in that. And I just, I, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to jump over this a little bit. Um, so um, I've also included in the in that email link a kind of, it's not a finalised piece, but it's kind of a, a version of what I'm working on at the moment. Um, so you can see um, my argument will be a lot more kind of tighter in the written, written thing. And so you can, if you're thinking, what does that mean? It might be kind of um, uh, uh, explained a little bit in, in, in the written piece. But I just want to sort of think about in a couple of different ways in which even though Ravenscroft is doing this very kind of cool thing of kind of drawing our attention to kind of perspective, yeah, um, it's kind of done in a kind of inconsistent, I think, and in, in kind of difficult way. Um, so let's just think about these in turn. I mean, one of the things she looks at is um, uh, uh, the, the brilliant like indigenously signed text uh, by Percy Mumbler, um, the Banyet, yeah, um, translated and transcribed by Roland Robinson, it sounds, in Roland Robinson's book, Black Fella, White Fella. Um, for Alison Ravencroft in Postcolonial Eye, White Australian Design of Visual Food and Race, yeah, um, it's kind of, she uses this as a way to sort of say, look, this is what's kind of wrong with the kind of, you know, writing that we get of people like, um, Lawson. Um, th this story, um, uh, the Banya, um, uh, two relations have an argument. Um, this sort of Banya creature appears. Um, a dad, a, a mum tells the dad to try and kind of calm it down. Um, this is all witnessed by a third. And the, um, uh, the, uh, the Banya is calmed down and it disappears and isn't seen again. Um, and that's basically the story, okay. Um, and for Gerald and Jacob in um, the Uncanny Australia book, um, they're viewing this as an uncanny and unheimish text, okay. And they're seeing it as uncanny for Mumbler, for the person telling the story. It's Mumbler's uncanny. Um, so Rayford's Cross focuses on a moment that, according to Gordon Jacobs, carries the unheimlish for Mumbler. Gordon Jacobs read in the work a sense of rootlessness, a lack of local specificity, and argue that this contributes to its status of ghost story. So it's a really short text, about one and a half pages long. And for Gordon and, and Jacobs, they say, look, look, Mumbler, Mumbler's not kind of, Mumbler hasn't really got a place. He, he's not kind of at home, you know. He's kind of in home and not home. He's kind of, he's not, he's not anywhere. Um, and that sense of rootlessness is somehow poetically caught up in the idea of a kind of a ghost's, you know, rootlessness. It's, it's circulations, it's iterations, it's lack of being at home. But in this, Ravencroft contends they make the first of their quite extraordinary slips because the story actually does end with a description of the Banyard's travels to specific places. Yeah, so it's Lake Ties Mission and Kempsey and other places. Um, so they're seeing a lack of kind of groundedness and, and, and certainty, but actually the text isn't doing that for Ravenscroft. So what they're seeing as Mumbler's kind of um, uncanny, not at homeness, is, is not quite carried out by the text. And what the language Ravencroft uses is that she says that they make slips, and that's kind of crucial to my reading. And they make a further slip in taking Mumbler himself out of place um, because they say that details of his own placement, his own belonging to a specific country, yeah, are given in the text's earlier publication. Um, they're not mentioned in um, uh, Jacobs and uh, Gelder's reading. The fact that the, the framing of the text um, uh, by the guy that translates and describes this actually do place Mumbler in a certain place. And they also make another slip um, in turning um, this to be about, um, uh, they refer, for example, to um, Mumbler's homestead. Yeah, but actually Mumbler is not in a homestead, you know. And 
and this is, you know, clearly very problematic. You know, I mean, this narrative is situated during a time of indigenous displacement in the southeastern eastern states. You know, um, the term homestead is absolutely not, you know, where um, uh, Mumbler is in, in any sense. And actually, it's a kind of, for, for Gelders, it, 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 it's a kind of a colonial framing, you know, um, which is completely inappropriate. So they're saying, look, um, these kind of critics are trying to see this as a kind of a, a not being in place. And that's a slip. Yeah, because there actually is a sense of place. And when they do give it place, they give it the wrong place. Okay. Um, what, what do I do kind of, what do I kind of make of this? Um, bear with me. Um, well, I mean, first of all, the idea that, you know, Mumbler is being placed, Mumbler isn't being placed by Mumbler. Yeah. Is being placed by the guy that, that translates and transcribes this. Percy's father is now dead, was King Jackie Mumbler. I mean, there's a whole five hours we could write about that statement in, in, it, in itself and, and, and that way it's so problematic. Well known to white residents of the South Coast. Percy was born in a Wagga Lake Mission. Um, Percy travels carrying his swag up and down the South Coast of Victoria. So this is a, um, he's in place you know, for, for Ravenscroft, but he's in place, he's placed from a perspective that isn't his own. He's placed in these kind of introductory comments, which are framing his narrative. So it's not that he has a place, or it's rather that the place that he has is placed by something else. And that means they're not totally securely and easily in place. That whole idea of place calls on another place, which is the place of the narration that's kind of framing this, and it's not his perspective. But there's also, I think, um, uh, some kind of further, further difficulties um, with this, if we, if we look at it. Um, I mean, one of the difficulties I have with this assessment is that the slips Gelder and Jacobs are understood to make are taken to be at the level of what I've been like what we could call content. Mumbler's read it was rootless, yet there is a reference to his country. The Bunya has understood not to be located despite the references to the place he travels. My concern is that the question of location is not exhausted in the correction of such slips. Mumbler's situation in country is even as Ravencroft describes it, not within the Bunyip, but located beyond this and narrated by another. The Bunyip is part of a collection of Mumbler's stories translated and transcribed by Robinson. The details of Mumbler's placement are from Robinson's frame of narrative a perspective that's not Mumbler's. Um, Mumbler is in place only by being out of place. His location is dependent on a narrating position beyond yet constitutive of his own. But more than this, as Ravencroft indicates, any location constructed with Mumbler's narratives are translated. There is thus a limit to understanding the Bunyip simply is a Mumbler's story told from his point of view. It's a difficulty that I read the narrative to engage, translated trans, uh, translated to differentiate from transcription. It's not about writing down speech, yeah, but something is, is going on here, yeah. Um, let's get a nice bit of it here. Uh, Mum told Dad to go out and talk to him in the language and to tell him to go away. They were all right. Dad went and spoke to him in the language. He talked to him. They're all right. No one doing any harm. You can go away. Dad followed him across the road, talking to him all the time in the language. I mean, the thing here, isn't it, is that actually that, you know, when mum told dad to go out and talk to him in the language, yeah, and dad says, we are all right, no one doing any harm. We are all right doing any harm isn't in the language. So the idea of, you know, the idea of slips here and the idea of location and the idea of a kind of a certainty and a lack of kind of those kind of weird divisions of the uncanny, I think in Ravenscroft is, is kind of about eliding the difficulty of translation and the idea of the fray. Because it's not as if we're all right, no one doing any harm, you can't go away, is unlike the rest of the text, because that bit is, is 
in the language, even though it's not here, because we know this whole thing anyway is translated and transcribed. Now, as far as I can read it, actually, this isn't kind of, um, this wasn't told to uh, Robinson in, in you in uh, or, you know, uh, or any other, you know, um, this was actually an English conversation, you know. So that idea of translated is difficult here, but clearly, according to Robinson, all of this language is not quite mumblers anyway. So that idea of kind of placement and being in place, I think can be problematized by that idea that what, like mumblers never quite in place because the frame, his framing language and the language that it's talking about are never quite themselves. And actually, that's, that's, that's then really interesting. And I'm afraid my pronunciation is going to be wrong on this, but the, this old fellow had a bunya, a mumbler, and it says, it was his power, his moon jin, uh, jar. The bunya was high in the front and low at the back, like a hyena, like a lion. Well, in, in a sense, that uh, mujin jar is, um, it is kind of the, in a way, it, it's the most resistant thing to translation because it isn't translated into English. Yet in the same way, in this frame, it's the most translatable thing. It was his power, his mujin jar. Um, there's the idea that, that the language is, is absolutely resistant, but absolutely translatable. And we then get this idea of, um, I don't know, Ingo, Ingo Way. Every time my dad spoke to him, he, that's the bunya, would roar. My old man was talking, everything is all right. Don't get savage here. The bunya went down to the, hook, the hill. and down into salt water. I've never seen the bunyip since my poor dad died. I'm thinking about translation here. In what sense is like dad and the bunyip talking to each other? Because my dad spoke to him, but he's spoken to him in the language, so this isn't what he said. And the bunyip would roar every time he does this. This seems to be a conversation but there seems to be an inequality here because we don't actually know, you know, the bunyip's roar isn't translated. So how exactly is this being framed? This is being framed as a conversation from a perspective on, which is neither of these things. What interests me about these kind of, these kind of issues of kind of translation, apart from it kind of, it kind of worrying an idea of a certain kind of comfort, a, a, easiness, a singularity of kind of place, in kind of an introducing an out of placeness, is that um, for, uh, um, for Ravenscroft, one of her key ideas is that um, we should always resist any idea of the ease of translation. What she wants to kind of argue for is an acknowledgement of difference as difference, working against that idea of the uncanny, that it is in some way about, you know, uh, you and I, are, you know, the one can be the other, that there is an absolute difference. And she writes a great length about the, um, the impossibility of um, actually, uh, um, of communicating across languages. But she doesn't kind of recognize that within this story, that seems to be one of the things that's going on here. Um, with an eye to time, I'm gonna kind of, uh, I'm gonna just talk very briefly about Donkey Devil. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, which is another indigenous design text. And in this one, I mean, the, this is the, the um, Paddy Rowe is, 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 is saying, is telling this, this story, and his, his granddaughter's with him as it's, uh, it's being transcribed. And it's about this donkey devil, and um, for this, um, this critic, uh, uh, the idea is that the meaning of the story is about that the donkey de devil is kind of like an absence. It's kind of a central defining absence. Um, 
because the daughter keeps her uh, granddaughter keeps sort of saying, "Isn't there? Isn't there?" As uh, Paddy Rose tells the story, um, and this kind of critic says that through understanding, you know, the granddaughter's interjections, we can come to the knowledge comported by the story. Yeah, um, that we can actually see through the granddaughter's eyes. And we can come as, you know, as outsiders to see this story exactly as she sees it. Yeah. Um, Wes Pavlov assumes the rest to rest his vision in the eyes of the young girl, says Ravencroft. If we follow his reading practice, he claims we will be in a position with Paddy Rowe's great granddaughter to come to the knowledge comported by the story. Wes Pavlov hopes to occupy the same position as this young indigenous girl and therefore come to her knowledge. But according to this argument, according to the argument that vision is corporealized, which is Ravenscroft argument, he cannot do this. He must remain in his own positions, which is to say his own embodiment with its attendant blind spots. Blind spots is a very important term that I'm going to return to. In this case, it's the donkey devil that falls into West Pavlov's blind spots. This is, this is where his vision fails, not the girl's. Whereas Pavlov, this critic, is saying, look, what this story is fundamentally about is the fact that we cannot see the donkey devil. It, it's not there. Yeah. And if we understand this, then we understand this from the perspective of this young girl. Ravenscroft is saying, no, yeah, you cannot look through someone else's eyes. That's the point, yeah. Um, vision has to be embodied. And actually all we can do here is read in Pavlov the point where his own vision fails, which is his inability to see from the perspective of the indigenous. So when we compare these two things, I'm, I'm thinking that there, there is already kind of two. Oh no, let's 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 look at one more thing, and then I'll kind of sum up a little bit. Um, okay. Um, for Ravenscroft, the vision to which West Pavlov aspires will never be realised, as it's in truth truth called realised. Yeah. Um, yeah. I kind of said that. Oh, and here's. Here's the bit where I'm going to do my um, trigger warning. Yeah, um, and you might want to look away um, uh, just while I'm doing this bit. Because what I'm kind of doing here, I'm kind of lining up kind of three different things that, was, uh, that uh, Ravenscroft is saying about kind of looking and, you know, being subjective and kind of. Um, she says that, you know, in terms of um, what Wes Pavel is saying, she says it is obscene to think that we can look through another's eye. So it's the worst kind of thing. And actually the power of her argument, the force of her argument, what's really good about her argument is that she's saying, um, you know, when her as a white academic is, is, um, is, is doing this, she shouldn't make any claims, any claims about um, indigenous understanding. What she should focus on is that point where her own vision fails because that kind of signifies that blind spot signifies the fact that there is another vision, that there is something escaping her, but she cannot kind of recolonize that and state about it. And that's why she says it's so important to see that it's always obscene to claim that we can look through another's eyes because it's always embroidered. And that's the thing about the uncanny, it's something specific and can't be a structural thing. But then she says this about, um, uh, Alexis writes a very famous book, Plains of Promise, which has this um, horrific uh, rape scene in it, um, which is quoted here, desperate enough to keep her living, keep living, she struggled, this young girl being attacked, to gasp mare, but her worthlessness she swallowed to the pit of her stomach. Meanwhile, he, this is this horrible looking chip, um, who is attacking her. Meanwhile, he would go, by God, push the devil out of the she-devil who was possessing him. In the course of these few sentences, the point of view has shifted suddenly to indirect discourse, Ravenscroft writes, carrying Jip's interior voice to us. I do lots on this, but I won't. Um, and bringing with it a disconcerting intimacy with his pleasure too, pulling a reader into the field of his desires. We begin by looking upon the girl's rape from a position outside the act, 
But we are then positioned with Jip, looking at the girl through his eyes. So there is one sense in which, you know, we can never look through the eyes of another, but also we can precisely do that. And if we line up kind of Plains of Promise and Donkey Devil and um, the Bunya, I think actually that Ravenscroft is offering an idea of perspective and the perspective of another in lots of different ways. In the Bunyip, the point of view of another is a factual textual element with the failure to address this count is as a slip. So when she's talking about Mumbler, yeah, it is the, you know, um, we're not thinking about any of the framing perspective. We're not thinking about um, the literary perspective of this text. When we're thinking about what is Mumbler's point of view, it's simply something like he talks about um, uh, Lake Tears mission. Yeah, that's his point of view. That literally is his point of view. The, the factual words themselves are somehow the point of view of Mumbler. Yeah. Um, it's also point of view is a bodily perspective that resists the reading of another. So it's something about me as a body that you can never see through my eyes. So it's a textual element. It's a fact in a text, but it's also kind of my body. Yeah. But it's also, as we've just seen with Jip, and uh, I should end my um, uh, trigger warning there, a bodily perspective that can be shared with another. This is a kind of a contradictory idea about what it might mean to have a perspective. My question, this is one that I explore in great length in my kind of article that you know you, you can read, is if we're countering that idea of a kind of overly structural uncanny with the idea that the uncanny must in some sense be about perspective, what are we saying perspective is? And how can we offer a consistent notion of perspective? Um, I think what must be recognized here is that actually Ravenscroft's writing on this is incredibly vertiginously brilliant. I mean, she is a really complicated writer on, on these ideas and a, a brilliantly insightful writer on kind of um, positionality and point. She writes, so to move subject positions is not to stand in another's position and look through his or her eyes, but to shift one's position in relation to other objects in a scene. Any subject only looks at the world through his or her own embedded vision. A new position which the subject takes up is still hers. That is because the subject is the position. There are no positions outside subjectivities. The observer is within the world and within his or her own body. Like the force of this argument is wonderful, isn't it? You know, it is that, that sense that it's not that I can, um, for example, look through Sam's point of view. Yeah, because my point of view is my point of view. It's not as if I can ever separate myself from it. It's not something I can go, because if I then look through Sam's point of view, it would still be my point of view. It would still be mine. You know, there is something necessarily embodied with it. And therefore, you know, we can't pretend to see from the point of view of people that are other than us in that way. The force of this argument is that there is a, um, we can only be satisfied with understanding the limit of someone else's argument. But actually, this is, this is really problematic stuff. Um, much more problematic than it might seem. Um, I'm gonna do the, the kind of complex problem and I'm gonna kind of try and simplify it. Um, if you look at, for example, this quote, in my eyes, the boy's body can, um, yeah, let's do that one, yeah. In my eyes, the boy's body and country appear in the way I've written. That's a quote that she um, says when she's um, talking about her own, uh, sorry, I missed that bit out, her own um, inability to see the perspective of an indigenous character, a, a young boy. In a, in a problem. Just think about that formulation. 
Um, the complication I read in all this is that Ravenscroft's framing of this positionality necessitates an access to this discrete vision of the subject. The vision, as it is understood, is constituted by an unaccountable otherness. Thus, for example, it is in my eyes the boy's body and country appear in the way I've written them. The eyes contain appearance. If it's in my eyes, the eyes are containing that which is within them, and therefore the eyes exceed the appearance. But what perspective, from what perspective, are these eyes perceived? At the very least, whatever vision that might be invoked cannot be the same as what stages or contains the appearance of the boy's body. A comparable um, problem can be read, for example, in the subsequent claim that any subject only looks at the world through his or her own embodied vision. This last is not itself seen, but only looked through. From what position then is embodied vision perceived? There is a further, and I think, stranger difficulty here as looking itself is excluded from the look. The look at the world, any subject only looks at the world through his or her own embodied vision, is not looked upon. We cannot see our own vision. All that seems kind of like maybe dancing around the, the head of a pin, but um, what it's about is that in all of these formulations, there is an excess. There is a kind of a seeing that's not being accounted for. There is something uncannily other. To see, even in Ravenscroft's complicated idea of what seeing means, always calls upon something else, some other narration, some other authority, some other perspective. Our perspective is never simply, simply our own perspective. And actually, and this is the kind of, kind of simplified but really important version, um, and it's, it's, it's something that um, from which I can just gesture to a much bigger world beyond it, but actually what Ravenscroft is getting in stuck in here is actually something central, something much debated. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, so don't worry, but what she is referencing here, what she is explicitly re referencing, is Lacanian ideas of the case. And the idea is in the Gans idea of the gaze is when you look at me, I've probably got a, a wonderful sort of thing I could use here. Oh. The idea is that um, when you look at the gaze, yeah. Uh, often we think about this when we think about like um, the, the the male gaze in film and stuff like that. There is the idea that somehow you know, without thinking about it too much, we think of the gaze as something that's kind of shooting out of characters' eyes, a bit like you know the Cyclops eye beam or something. You know, this is kind of active thing that looks at us. For the can, the idea is that the gaze is simply where our own seeing stops. Of course, this isn't looking at you. It would be a spooky and horrible idea if you thought that pictures actually looked at you. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, um, you know, this can't see you. So why do we get that sense that it's looking out? Well, it's simply that this is the point where we can no longer see. I cannot see that which seems to be a perspective on me. How long have I got? Yeah, I've got this. Okay, I'm going to do it here. The way we can un um, understand this is in that ancient and famous story, you know, about the um, uh, the battle between two artists to do the most realistic picture, the best picture, and one of them um, paints grapes. They're so realistic, they kind of call the birds down from the very air, and they hurt their little beaks as they peck upon them. And the other artist goes, "Oh, game's up. I clearly lost." And the, the grapes artist is a generous soul, so he says, you know, um, no, I'm sure your picture's fine. You know, we might as well have a look at it. Losing artist says it's over there behind the curtain. Seemingly winning artist goes and, 
you know, grabs the curtain, he touches paint and plaster. It's a painted curtain. What's the, what's the moral of this story? You know, it's that if we're making a kind of a lure to nature, you know, that only goes sort of so far, you know, to really construct the notion of the real, one has to offer up an impediment. It's the impediment that constructs the notion that there is something beyond it. That the idea, as you look at me, that of my kind of agency and individuality, the vastness of the resources hidden behind my eyes, you know, my very self, is simply your inability to see. Ravenscroft kind of only half gets that. I would contend, because she seems to do the more, and I, I, I say that my, um, at present, my whole career, most of my, like 90% of my career is actually criticizing kind of such Lacanian ideas. I'm not, I am I'm not a Lacanian, um, but Ravenscroft, I think, wants to be one. But for her, actually, what the gaze does, what the blot does, what the limit does, what our inability to see another's perspective does, is actually to tell us that there is another perspective there. So actually the indigenous perspective is constructed for her through the white failure to see it. But actually for Lacan, sort of interestingly, worryingly, difficultly, there is no other perspective there. That this isn't a veil over something else. It's a veil over nothing. And that doesn't mean that this isn't about, you know, it, it is it's necessarily about the erasure of indigenous perspectives. It's that indigenous perspectives have to come from indigenous perspectives. That actually what Ravenscroft's argument is doing is constructing the idea of something that is present and available behind the veil, that we know there is genuinely something there. And in a sense, that brings us back to asymptosis. It's that idea that actually there is something that cannot be touched. There is something other and different that remains constantly in a state of otherness and a state of purity because of our own very limitation to get it that actually the kind of, the intelligence, the ethical dimension of Ravenscroft's argument, her, her understanding that as a white academic, her, her focus must be on her own limitations, can actually be understood to be the very thing that allows her to get caught up in this kind of problematic argument of asymptosis, just as actually Lawson's own subtlety, his, his commitment to a materialism that is always retrospectively constructed is the thing that actually allows him to become uncannily, dangerously close to that which he worries. Okay, that's my time.